they think divide. This is the title of this Summer of Love event. As you might have seen, this webinar is recorded and this is because we want to put together a nice collection um, of these events so that they can be available to also to those who cannot be um, here today. So first of all, um, let me thank Jennifer Lundquist and Chantelle Bax and apologies if I pronounced your surname. Uh, I didn't ask how to pronounce the surname before, which uh, is always a very good question. Uh, so I I'll do it now. Jennifer, how do I pronounce your surname correctly? You got it right, Lundquist. Lundquist, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Chantelle Bax. So thank you very much for being for being here. This was one of the first events that I organized when thinking of the summer of love and of exploring uh, uh, digital romance. And uh, uh, we are very sorry that Celeste, Celeste Currington cannot be here today. Um, she she's not feeling well at the moment, so she had to. She had to renounce to be here and uh, uh, we wish her prompt recovery, first of all, and also she'll be um, missed during this event. I'm sure that there will be further occasions for us to collaborate and uh, um, and, and Celeste is the co-author uh, of the Dating Divide, the book that gives the title to today's event. Let me also thank Nate, that is, um, uh, you can see him there, Nate is still on video. Generally, Nate wants to disappear, but then sometimes he forgets to, so then I wouldn't, but thanking you, Nate is the director for the Center for Digital Inquiry at PORIC, um, so he's the one that gave us the platform to um, organize uh, this uh, uh, series of events. Right. So without further ado, let me present you more in more details today's speakers. So um, Jennifer Lundquist is professor of sociology and senior associate dean of research and faculty development with the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So it's a very it's a very long job title. Uh, I guess the short is professor of sociology, which is uh, like, you know, an evergreen, a classic. And she received a joint PhD in demography and sociology from the University of Pennsylvania. And her research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, Mellon and Humboldt, and covered by outlets ranging from Time, Newsweek, Washington Post, the New York Times and National Public Radio. So if you know what I mean, we have someone uh, um, quite important here with us today. So thanks again for, for having accepted this invitation. So um, Jennifer examines the pathways through which racial, ethnic and gender inequalities are perpetrated and sometimes undone in various institutional settings, such as the military, the dating marriage market, which is what we will focus on today, and in um, families. So she published her research in a variety of academic journals and uh, uh, including the American Journal of Sociology and the American Sociological Review. And she's also the co-author of two editions of the well-known demography, the study of human population textbook. And she was a columnist also for Inside Higher Education from 2017 to 2019. Her most recent book is the one uh, um, that we will explore, that we will focus on today. It's titled The Dating Divide, Race and Desire in the Era of Online Romance. And it's co-authored with Professor Celeste Currington and Ken Hu Lin. So using millions of online interactions and data from mainstream dating websites and then extensive archival research, they um, look at the manifestation of sexual racism in digital dating uh, um, environments. So I won't tell you more about it because this is exactly the topic of the uh, talk that Jennifer is going to uh, offer us in, uh, in a few seconds. Just enough 
to uh, thank again Chantel for, for being here. Chantel is assistant professor at Florida State University with a joint appointment in the Department of Sociology and the Program for African American Studies. And she's also affiliated with the Women's Studies and Women's Gender Sexuality Studies Program. She got a BA in Sociology from Duke University and then she studied sociology at the University of Houston and, uh, and the University of Texas, where she uh, got a PhD in 2017. And her thesis was in African and African diaspora studies and women's and gender studies. So I'm very happy that today we have two sociologists. We had um, people from a variety of disciplines um, in these last couple of months, uh, and uh, I'm really uh, and also it's a very good moment for me as I'm reading a lot of sociological books. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking here, I'm reading this one at the moment, which is Illuts, uh, The End of Love. But I'm also reading other stuff that is very sociological in uh, perspective. So uh, I'm really looking forward. So, and um, so, um, Chantel, Research Center on Culture, Race and Racism, Gender Intimacy, and digital life and also work in equity in academia. There would be a lot to say about also the latter actually. And most of our current published work explores how race and ethnicity, gender and sexuality shape the ways that people build and negotiate intimate relationships. So it's very much like when I saw Chantel's profile, I was like, okay, this is exactly the person that I really wish could participate to this series of events. And and also, like through this work, Chantal illustrates our interpersonal relationships, structure and reify identities and social inequalities. Um, and uh, recently she wrote about the representation of race, gender and sexuality in popular culture, racial and gender inequality in academic spaces, and also importantly for us in platforms such as Twitter, but okay, Cupid. So, I guess the floor is yours. We'll have Jennifer talking and then Chantel, and then we can turn this space into a bit of a um, a bit of a more open space with people from the audience uh, uh, participating with questions and, and comments. So Jennifer, uh, the floor is yours. Well, great. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. And thank you, Carolina. This has been a, a really brilliant idea to host this series, a Summer of Love series. I've followed the last two events on YouTube um, and the discussion has been fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to that. Also very happy to meet you, Chantel. Your work has been influential in the writing of this book and other work. So uh, looking forward to what you have to say. And again, a quick shout out to my two co-authors, Celeste and Ken, who were not able to be here today, um, but whose collaboration on this project and book has been absolutely critical and a really a great uh, experience. So Carolina asked that I summarize our book in about 20 minutes, which I will do. I'm going to time myself so I make sure I don't take up too much time. So the, the project for our book began when online dating became a major new trend in the ways in which people were meeting one another. Really starting from the advent of GPS sourcing phones from about 2010 forward. And this is a really major new innovation in the evolution of courtship and late capitalism and really interested us for that reason. So some background, for centuries, the process of courtship has been overseen and regulated by the family, the church and the state, all of whom have a vested interest in the social order and allocation of wealth and property. And the concept of dating per se really emerged in the early 20th century and what I mean by that is this emergence of unchaperoned outings, often involving some degree of consumption, which began first in urban areas and began to uh, spread out throughout the United States in the early 1900s. And this was very much driven, like many other social changes, uh, by industrialization and the economic transformation that came with it, changes in the role of the individual and family and gender. And so this is when young people for the first time began to have more independence and autonomy in the selection of their sexual and marital partners uh, and where the influences over who one selects as a partner shifted more to one's peer networks and related institutions like school and friends. But in the United States, 
This transition to dating emerged during a social climate of intense fear and anxiety on the part of white Americans who feared that racial mixing in a post bellum setting of the United States would threaten their social and economic status uh, in a society that was built, is built upon white supremacy. This was at the same time that eugenic science was becoming widely embraced by science, scientists and academics. And this resulted in the proliferation of anti-miscegenation laws, which really became intensively enforced from the early 1900s through the 1940s. These legally regulated who could have sexual relations and marry whom, with its primary focus being separating white Americans from black Americans. And in many states, this was also extended to police whites from intermixing with Asians, Latinos, et cetera, felony offenses. So anti-miscegenation law was the core mantle of Jim Crow policy in the United States. And in order for it to be legally enforced, the, it had to further define and construct race into a, a series of much, much more highly specified racial categories. So this is all to say that the invention of dating and the invention of race in the United States happened together. And in this book, we argue that modern notions of romance have been inevitably and deeply imprinted with racialized desire and calculus of the United States. So anti-miscegenation law was struck down in the US in the late 1960s, along with other Jim Crow era laws that legalized racial segregation across all facets of our social and economic life. But racial apartheid lived on in the United States, but structurally in terms of where we live, where we work, where we go to school, what our opportunity structure is, who goes to prison, who dies at the hands of the state, what our health outcomes are, life expectancy, and it infuses our belief systems and our social hierarchies. So when the dating market began to move online, and now arguably with the pandemic has become all the more entrenched in our culture, here we see one more crucial step away from that third party oversight and courtship choices with the internet now being the primary way that couples meet in the United States. It now surpasses every other single way of meeting, um, uh, which until the internet had been prim primarily through families, friends, work, schools, et cetera. All of those ways of meeting were highly dictated by peer regulation and in a still highly racially segregated society were very racially homogenous. So we were really interested from an intellectual perspective in the beginning of this project what are the implications of the movement online of the dating market for the erotic life of race? Online dating in theory has no segregation, but how might daters themselves perpetuate and reproduce and amplify the racial hierarchies and, and prejudice from the offline world? And also we wanted to know how can it be an agent of disruption of the racial order as well? So these are all questions that our book explores. We examine millions of online dating profiles and interactions from one mainstream US dating platform. And it was those interactions of who contacted whom and who responded to whom that really interested us because that gave us full data on, on what people actually do in their private lives rather than what they might say they do, say in a survey. We also conducted interviews of 77 black, Latino, Asian, multiracial, white women and men, both straight and gay in order to enrich our quantitative data and also to be able to see variations from the norm of, of the quantitative data. Um, so we devote a chapter in each book to each group and there's a lot of nuance and variation. So I'm just going to give you a nutshell, crude example or crude summary of what our findings were. But in a nutshell, we found that race is a deal breaker for of all characteristics on a profile. It operates more strongly, controlling for all kinds of other factors, more strongly than social class, education, physical characteristics, et cetera. We also found that despite the narrative that also seeped into uh, conversations uh, in the interviews with white men, so despite the narrative of sort of the decline of the white male or the aggrieved white male, um, and we often heard men saying, you know, it's an un this transition is unfair, online dating doesn't work for us, et cetera. We found that white men were the most desired of all men. So among all women and almost all gay men, this preference was strongest among whites, that is white women and, and white gay men, but also statistically significant for other races as well, who were still most likely to respond to white men first and only secondly men of their same race. On the other hand, when it comes to preferences for women, 
among straight men and lesbians, we found that whiteness was not the defining characteristic per se, but rather same race, what demographers call homophily, homophily patterns. So men of all races, lesbians of color, do not seem to have a first preference for white women, but rather their same ethnic group. And unlike straight women and gay men, they are also more open to people from other racial groups, except for, and this is important, except for black daters. We document a persistent and specific anti-blackness that operates among the sexual preferences of white, Asian, Hispanic, and multiracial straight men and gay women. We explain these patterns in many different ways, but for the most part, they are rooted in the hegemonic valorization of white masculinity in US society that operates most strongly among whites, but has also been internalized and reproduced by marginalized groups. On the other hand, white femininity, interestingly, does not carry the same hegemonic appeal across all groups as white masculinity seems to, something we delve into more deeply in the book, but which very much relates to gender hierarchies and patriarchy, where association, association with white masculinity is, it goes beyond just the sexual allure, but also symbolizes economic and cultural power in a way that white femininity and femininity more generally does not. So I wanna talk a little bit about the ways in which people articulated their preference. So the commodification of people in uh, what our interviewees often describe as an industrial assembly line of online dating, that large, transactional and anonymous space makes it very easy to objectify and dehumanize others. And in so doing, it also normalizes this idea of a racial preference. So in many ways, we argue that racial preference categories and filters in online dating platforms is, is really a, arguably a privatized version of the historical anti-miscegenation laws in the United States. However, neoliberal choice narrative of around choice and individualism gives folks the language to frame it as something natural and more innocent. The dating market is one of the only venues left in modern day US society where it remains acceptable to articulate racial preferences. In every other space, be it education, employment, housing, lending, racial preferences have been recognized as not only legally but also morally wrong. Yet, racial filters in our private lives are explicitly part of the selection process of most dating websites. The interviews that we had, very often the ways in which people would talk about their racial preferences would be to describe who they were attracted to in racial terms as being idiosyncratic, natural, random, uncontrollable. But this is contradicted by our quantitative findings and the findings of many other studies that are also looking at these same kinds of patterns, they show that racial preferences are predictably and systematically patterned, and they align with historical and sociological racial hierarchies. Now, this random choice narrative was much more often held by white daters, um, as well as lighter skin tone daters who often passed as whites in their dating habitus. Most daters of color that we interviewed, especially black daters, were far more critical of this rhetoric of, of racial choice, racial preference. Um, and this is just one of the areas where our work really resonates with Professor Bugg's work. So when we talk about digital sexual racism in our book, this is the, a large focus, we're really talking about an old concept, sexual racism. And that, that's as old as the fears that put anti-miscegenation law into place last century. And discussions around sexual racism were also emergent in the 1970s in analyzing gay sexual subjectivity. But sexual racism interacts with fast evolving digital technologies in new ways. So there, there are two ways that we, we conceptualize that in the book. The first is, as I've already been saying, these sites introduce mechanisms of racial categorization and filters that block out entire groups of people from a public dating market space. So just the existence alone of a standard drop down box that filters people by their race it disciplines people into believing that having a racial preference in a partner is something that should be. And then a special case of this beyond users making the decision to filter, of course, is a role of algorithms. Some of which are explicitly built into the matching process and some apps, they operate behind the scenes to generate who we even see on these platforms, leading to what could have been a very desegregated space 
a very segregated space. And this is one realization that we had while we were researching this project that was really interesting. So we were drawn to look at courtship in this scenario where third party mediators have really receded. But we hadn't really thought about them being replaced by the influence of for profit corporations and their influence over the matching process, which is a really interesting uh, concept to think about. Um, and so even in the dating platforms that explicit, explicitly say that they do not use race in their algorithms, no design, design choice is neutral. And oftentimes the matching algorithms are informed by past user behavior, uh, which simply builds in racial bias, perpetuates any kind of bias that was pre-existing in, in, in the system. So that's the first component of digital sexual racism. And that's a more passive version. The other aspect is not so passive. And that is the technology also enables and fosters the expression of aggressive forms of sexual racism that occur much less frequently than in face-to-face -face courtship markets, than in face-to-face -face courtship markets. So you have this sort of desegregated, or the potential for desegregated space in online dating. It's exposing people to others who they did not ordinarily come into contact with. But, you know, it, it, especially in the still highly racially segregated United States offline. Now that increased exposure combines with the internet's unique ability to bring out people's innermost thoughts due to what we call the online disinhibition effect as a social scientist. And that exposes people to racialized and gendered sexual harassment and abuse that while has always been there, many have not experienced it directly before. It's very difficult to deny the deeply rooted misogyny and racism once you've spent any time in an online space, especially one with unmediated communication channels. For example, one where it, you know, both people don't have to swipe in order to start the communication. And there is a trauma uh, it, to encountering this kind of interaction on a day-to-day -day basis, even though intellectually one is aware that it existed. So digital sexual racism then systematically segregates cyberspace. It reinforces categorical thinking. It polices digital self-presentation, all without the need of in-person avoidance and confrontation. And this builds on the work of scholars like Ruha Benjamin, uh, Sonu Betty, Safia Noble, and others whose scholarship also documents the ways that new technologies are reproducing uh, racial inequalities. So people often ask us, well then, you know, should we remove racial filters? But might that be a solution? And Grindr, after a lot of pressure from its user base, did this in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder last summer. But this is really complicated. So at the same time that daters of color felt very uncomfortable with this concept of racial preferences, they also spoke about how having racial filters allowed them to circumvent that harassment and abuse or, or racialized fetishization by uh, you know, communicating only with people from their shared ethnic heritage. Many daters of color also told us that dating within their race was uh, an act of resistance to racism uh, against their community or a form of ethnic pride um, or simply a way to find love and acceptance in a community with a shared experience of being of color in a white dominated society. Nor would we ever argue that all would be well if multiracial relationships became the norm rather than the exception. Studies show that again and again, the intimacy is still fraught with gender and racial inequalities. So instead, what we argue, and I look forward to the conversation, is that people, especially white people, whose power and influence is most dominant in reinforcing racial stereotypes when they reject categories of people, start by acknowledging the political implications of racialized sexual desire. So our, our interviews show time and time again a disconnect between how people view race as a public issue and how race operates in their private lives. For example, someone might be very active in the BLM movement and think of themselves as really progressive, but still have racial preferences in dating. So our intimate choices have consequences and they are informed by historical and ongoing constructions of race. Being aware of the implicit and explicit racial biases that animate our desires and our actions is at least the beginning of an act of resistance. And what can dating platforms do? Well, I think we also need to remember that they rely on, on profit and surveillance capitalism. We're, we're foolish to think that they have the power or the interest 
in creating healthy and equitable social institutions. And the dating market is a social institution. And so, you know, that's another question for you all. Online dating markets can be an incredibly powerful tool. Is there a way to form online dating markets that outside of the for-profit space to create healthier spaces? But in the meantime, we argue that dating companies should be pressured to make the operation of race in their platforms more transparent. This means making their algorithms transparent, what variables go into them, how are they constructed, and how and when do they operate. And I wouldn't argue that algorithms should be eradicated. Narrowing down choice is critical, and it's a massive online dating space. Um, but it can be random, right? Reset A reset button that erases history with an app or an opt-out button that lets you turn off the recommendation algorithm could be an option. Or just more imaginative algorithms right, um, that are not based on ethnicity and race. Also, platforms can report what are their statistics and how often their users report other users for harassing and abusive interactions. What is the company's position on the politics of race and intimacy? So uh, we're running out of time, or maybe we have already. So I hope that in the discussion, uh, we can also discuss something that I didn't get to, but which is how do users resist the norms um, that we find in our research, right? How are people using dating apps differently from how companies intended their use? How are they using them in empowering ways, potentially re repurposing them to their own uses? So thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Zen. I think that your talk, I mean, you, you really shared with us um, a lot of interesting points and uh, I'm sure that we can follow different threads in the discussion and uh, uh, first of all with the uh, uh, Chantel contribution. But what I want to say is that I think that talking about uh, um, race or uh, inequalities in general, not all racial inequalities, gender inequalities, class inequalities, when it comes to uh, dating, it really sheds light on uh, the fact that our desire that in contemporary society we perceive as something authentic, private, um, almost in a sense innate. So the, the, it's a sort of a positive, uh, simple force that has to do only with us and our private emotions. And our private emotions are true because we are ourselves. And this is something that Evilus explains very well. So, Desire and attractions are understood as part of this private sphere. They have been removed from the public sphere. This is the sense in which they have been um, liberated by the sexual revolution. So liberated from what? Liberated from the public dimension. And so it is a specific type of liberation. And I think that uh, one of the um, implications of this uh, is that it is difficult to think desire in its political, character. And I think this also explains partially what you're saying so that, okay, um, racial preferences are just fine in most dating websites, but of course they couldn't be. If you want to hire someone, of course you couldn't. Or at least, I mean, biases is, is there and it's difficult to eradicate, but it's surely something that cannot be. And so why it is still acceptable uh, and I think it, it's exactly because then uh, desire is difficult to conceptualize uh, politically. So in a sense, in a pre-modern courtship, uh, that was much more evident uh, in a sense. Uh, like the fact, of course you date someone from your class and if not, then you go down, you know, the, uh, you may end up being the protagonist of a, of a, of a novel, but it's not gonna necessarily work unless you're Lady Shatterly and everything kind of goes well there. But you see what I mean? So um, I think that this is, this is also very important because it's also the matter of, okay, is desire political? And if so, how do we relate to it? And also do we have, because there is also a, a kind of an understanding of desire. Of course you have the right to desire whatever you desire in a, in a bit of an unproblematic way. So do we have the right to prefer whatever we prefer, how preferences and desires connect? So I think that uh, these uh, uh, very rich sociological explorations that you did uh, uh, kind of also hit at a cultural and 
if you want also philosophical point of what is desire and uh, as these uh, i don't know very complex and uh, not force that links the private and the public uh, in non-obvious uh, um, way so yes it's um it's i think i think this is one of a crucial issue when we think about sexuality uh, from a cultural social or even philosophical sense uh, but i'm sure that yes chantelle has definitely more to say than me in this uh, in this respect and in other respects. So Chantel, the floor is uh, is yours, and uh, we are kind of very much on time, so uh, you don't need to rush. Just uh, um, just share your ideas with us. Thank you. I thought I unmuted. <laughs> uh, hi. Good afternoon early evening. I don't know exactly where we are time zone wise at this point. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I, I started reading uh, Dating Divide this week. Um, so it, it's kind of nice to be, uh, I mean, obviously I, I read a lot of um, your trio, your triumvirate's <laughs> work um, in kind of the work I was doing for my dissertation and the work I've been doing since, um, but it's it's nice to kind of read it as this cohesive argument. Um, yeah, I guess I didn't really put together, I think a really like kind of constructed presentation. Uh, I wasn't totally sure, I think kind of where the conversation was going to go today. Um, I guess I'll kind of give a kind of short-ish version, I guess, of kind of how I got to this work. Um, so really the kind of start of me being interested in this topic of particularly online dating um, and multiracial people's experiences with it uh, really started in 2012. Uh, I was at a conference sitting, it, it was a critical mixed race studies conference and was kind of sitting around in between sessions, having conversation with other people who were attending the conference. And um, as I think is wont to do with kind of people in my age group, the conversation turned <laughs> to online dating experiences. Um, so it was just really interesting kind of hearing all of these different multiracial people talk about their dating experience um, and kind of strategies that they were using to prevent certain kinds of interactions on the apps, um, but also just like dynamics within their relationships. So like one person was talking about who was a, a, a black white multiracial person was talking about having blackness competitions with their black partner and then there was uh, an Asian white uh, person who was talking about you know not even putting that they were Asian on their profile because they didn't want people you know with kind of Asian fetishes uh, and so just kind of that initial conversation I was really curious about was there something qualitatively different about multiracial people's online dating experience uh, you know, from anybody else, because obviously we'd had, you know, publications that were coming out at that time, you know, that kind of were talking about this racism, especially I think uh, on, on kind of gay dating apps that were geared towards men. Um, we have less research actually that explores uh, the experience, the dating experiences of queer women or women interested in other women, but there's a wealth of research, right, on, on gay men. And there's a lot of discussion and a lot of, uh, exploration of the racial politics of, of desire within uh, gay men's spaces, both on and offline. Um, so yeah, so I was really just like, you know, is there something really kind of different happening for multiracials? And then you start to see these publications coming out, not just among academics, but I mean, quite literally Christian Rudder published, you know, uh, this um, dataclism, right? And he's using data from, OK Cupid from Google, from other places, uh, that seems to suggest, right, that there's some kind of preferential treatment that multiracials receive. Uh, so for me, I was just kind of like, OK, is this just kind of a thing that's being observed, right, you know, in mass online? But is that actually, right, kind of people's individual experiences? And is, you know, getting a plethora of messages, is that actually success? <laughs> right. And I think uh, a lot of what this research is kind of asking us to think about is what does it mean to be successful in dating? Um, just because you're getting a lot of messages or a lot of attention online, does that actually lead to a successful dating life outside of the website? Um, and, and based on the conversations I had with women for my dissertation, I don't think that that's necessary. I don't think that that correlation is super clear uh, for a whole host of reasons. Um, I think 
particularly right the way that uh, Dr. Lundquist was talking about right with the ways that these websites are designed to you know kind of put certain pressures on people and also to corral them in certain ways. Uh, you know, we already have lots of evidence about the ways that people, you know, I guess kind of fib a little bit, right, in terms of their profiles, whether that's using older photos, using filtered photos, use, you know, lying about height, lying about weight, those kinds of things, right? So there's already these aspects that just about everybody who participates in this kind of online presentation of self, you know, kind of, I think, fudges with a little bit. Um, and I think dating websites in particular, I think really kind of add that extra pressure. Uh, and I think when we kind of put this into context with uh, a whole host of other kinds of social media, um, particularly I think like Instagram and Snapchat and some of these others, you know, where we've seen these other kinds of impacts where you literally have certain kinds of, you know, plastic surgery trends that are happening because of the ways that people's kind of have had their vision of like what an attractive person looks like has been altered, right? So I think all of that, right, is, is informing <laughs> these dynamics online. And so again, for me, it's like, what does it mean for a multiracial person to have more success within this space? Uh, because I think when we're looking at the interactions online, it's kind of difficult to account for things like colorism or featureism um, or other aspects that are absolutely going to impact someone's experience when they meet face-to-face. Uh, so I, so that was, I think, kind of a, a significant kind of component of the conversations I had with the women that I talked to. Uh, and then, so I talked to, you know, 31 women, actually, uh, when I was doing the dissertation. And then uh, since then, I've done started, I've done some interviews with white men who are interested in interracial relationships. Uh, and then I'm in the process of following back up with uh, that original 30 women that I talked to, because it's been about five years since I've talked to them. Um, and since I talked to them and recruited them while they were actively using the dating app, um, so they, some of them were single, some of them were in polyama, polyamorous relationships, um, but they were actively using the app, right, when I talked to them. Uh, I'm just kind of curious to see where things are about five years later or so. Um, so I think one of the things that has become really, I think, clear to me in doing this work are, is that uh, I think we really have to do a better job of accounting for the social political climate and its impact on the dating experience. And so I think that uh, y'all get into some of this in, in, in your book, obviously kind of doing that historicizing, right? Um, of kind of legal construction. Uh, but I, so much of the current kind of dating research that even thinks about politics, thinks about it more in the form of political affiliation. So like what political party are you affiliated with? Um, and that to me, I don't think is sufficient. Uh, I think especially with the ways that, uh, you know, dating apps have, I think, felt pressure to respond to the political moment. Uh, so, you know, you see apps like OkCupid literally introducing banners for um, Planned Parenthood, um, the ACLU, uh, you see people, you know, kind of putting their own hashtags into their profile. So they're putting, you know, Black Lives Matter into the profile. They're putting no Trump voters, you know, in their profiles. Um, even with uh, things like uh, Bumble, um, you know, banning you posting photos of you with guns, unless you are in military or law enforcement uniform, thus necessitating you having the gun in your, on your person, I guess. Right. So, uh, and, and even Grinder, I think, to an extent, right, is, you know, kind of trying to account for the ways that sexual racism has been happening on that on that site. And so, you know, they're pledging to remove certain kinds of filters, right, to try to reduce that. So for me, I think there's also just this really interesting shift in, I think, the kinds of discourses that get communicated through people's profiles. Um, and and I think particularly with a space like OkCupid or any of the others that use things like matching questions, uh, the matching questions obviously help to feed the algorithm, but I think what's interesting with them is where those questions come from. And many, obviously the people who, who run OkCupid can come up with questions, but many questions are you know user submitted. 
Um, and it's still not super clear to me exactly like kind of what the vetting process is for those user submitted questions. Um, but, you know, like when I was doing my research back in 2015, you know, I was doing this kind of digital ethnography of the site when the blank lives matter question, you know, match question starts to pop up. Um, and since that time, you know, I've seen all kinds of other questions about uh, building a wall or, or, you know, other kinds of things that are related to the broader kind of social political discourse. Um, and so I think that that's a thing that as research on online dating or just kind of dating generally, I think goes forward. I think we need to move beyond just what is your political party affiliation? Um, and I think really kind of get into these other kinds of deeper, I think, aspects of, of politics and how that is shaping, uh, you know, kind of how people, as I called it, right, vet each other. But I think also, right, this shaping of what it means to be desirable, because again, right, it's, it seems to be kind of uh, confusing, right, that people want people who are, I mean, they'll say they want people who aren't racist, who aren't sexist, who aren't X, Y, Z, right? Because that's what you're supposed to want, right? But then they seem to have a, like this kind of like confusion or this like disjunction where they still desire, right? Uh, you know, kind of cisgender, heterosexual white men, you know, and, and particularly with the women that I interviewed, there was a lot of desire for like white men with beards, like this very particular, aesthetic <laughs> that they were like very attracted to. Um, so, so there's there's kind of all of those aspects, right? Um, and I think that another big part of, of my research was also thinking about how the role that these women in particular's families played in their dating life. And I mean, obviously we have other research that talks about, particularly with interracial relationships, you know, and the comfort of bringing home a person of a different race. Uh, and a, a lot of that interracial dating research actually doesn't talk to multiracials. Um, I think we, we get a lot of research on multiracial families as, you know, kind of upending some of these logics about, um, race, I think, and I, and I think there's this kind of iconography in our broader popular culture, particularly, I think, in the US. I don't think it translates as well to, to other parts of the West, but definitely in the United States and probably to an extent in Canada. Uh, you know, right, that, that a multiracial family and interracial relationship, right, is, is doing something inherently progressive, right? Um, and so a, a there has been, I think, an extensive amount of research that has shown actually that there's all kinds of racism that still happens within the context of these interracial relationships within these multiracial families. But I think we still have a lot of room to, to learn about, I think, how certain kinds of racial logics get passed down again about, because if you're a product of an interracial relationship, can we assume that you're going to have some kind of progressive logic about what it means for you know, partners of any kind of racial background to be attractive, right? Or are you a person who lives in the same, right, you know, heterosexist, racist world that everyone else lives in, and you're also internalizing those ideas? So it's like this interesting kind of combination of the messages from the family, plus those cultural messaging um, that's shaping, I think, particularly how these multiracial women that I talk to are approaching. Uh, dating. I have no idea. Okay, I'm going like 12 minutes. <laughs> I was like, where's the time? Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, I have lots of, I think, kind of plans thinking about this work going forward. I, I really want to do, I think, more work with, with queer women's experiences. And I, I think there's some other folks who are starting to explore that as well. Um, yeah, I don't. I think I'll just kind of stop there because I feel like some of the things I'd have to say, I think we'll just, I, I think, effectively reiterate. I think a lot of what Jen already said. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. That's, there are a lot of elements, and uh, I can see that yours is uh, also a work in progress that you want to keep on working on this uh, line following your dissertation. Uh, um, and it's always very interesting, I think, to do these follow-up interviews. Uh, it's amazing how we can contradict ourselves just and just create kind of a, um, a bit of um, fictionalized memories of what our thoughts were. So um, we shall be curious to know 
more about it. And uh, Jennifer, do you want to, um, I don't know, comment on uh, what Chantel had said or uh, what I said before? Um, Sure, yeah, I would love to. Um, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but there's so much to um, riff off of uh, what you both said. So one of the things that uh, Chantel, you mentioned uh, was uh, this blackness competition among some of the multiracial daters that you interviewed. Um, and that really resonates with some of the um, interviews that we had with multiracial daters as well. In fact, I remember a sentiment from um, a man who was biracial, black and white, um, who actually said the, the reason that he tended not to contact black women uh, was because he feared that he wasn't black enough. Um, and so there's some just really interesting dynamics that came out in the qualitative interviews um, that helped us better understand what is meant by anti-blackness and the quantitative data, right? You begin to see the nuance of why people are not contacting folks, et cetera. Um, but that's definitely an anxiety um, among uh, you know, some, some folks in the biracial community. So uh, yeah, I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I think some of that is rooted in phenotype. Of course, my dog picks up a loud toy. <laughs> I hope y'all cannot hear that. Uh, so some of that is definitely kind of a phenotype thing. So like you're less authentically black if you're lighter skinned or if you don't have certain kind, if you have maybe more Eurocentric features, but there's also right the kind of cultural kind of authenticity. Um, and in past research I've done with multiracial college students, uh, multiracial, especially multiracial black men, right, had, uh, and, and I think some other research reflects this. Uh, so I'm blanking on Remy's last name, but he's got stuff with Jennifer Sims. Uh, so the, I think particularly for multiracial men of like who are perceived as men of color, um, that there can be this, I think, greater investment in like the, the non-white form of masculinity, particularly if that lends, I think, right, a certain kind of authenticity or greater desirability. Um, so I, I think particularly for a lot of multiracial black men, right, that while blackness is, you know, viewed as cooler, more masculine, more heterosexual, right, there's, there, there obviously are negatives to being perceived as black, but I think in a romantic sexual economy, there's a lot of positives. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so I think that it's hard, I think, to tease out that nuance, right, where it can be a colorism thing, but it can be all of these other kind of deeper factors as well. Um, yeah, and it's really, I think, hard to tease those out, which is, you know, I think the importance of doing the qualitative work, but even so, right, like kind of how, <laughs> how representative can even the qualitative work be? Right. Um, you know, that's, I think, the thing that I'm always, you know, kind of remembering with this is, is you know, these are the people who agreed to talk to us. <laughs> so it's right. like, what aren't we hearing from the people who aren't agreeing to talk to us? Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's where, you know, Reddit forums and whatnot come in handy. Um, yeah. It was, there's a lot there. Yeah, yeah. So I have, I've had some grad students who are working on stuff with like the, you know, the Reddit red pill mm -hmm. people and the incels and, and that kind of whole thing. And I know some folks who are starting stuff on the super straights. And so, so the, these, these are all, I think, things that are crossing over, obviously, with, with certain kinds of like racial logics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they have these particularly, you know, kind of regressive ideas about gender, particularly with the super straights. Um, and, and I think also, right, to an extent, right, with the, with the incel red pill, right, you know, kind of communities. And so, you know, kind of how does that cross over with logics about race? Um, and, you know, to an extent, right, kind of just logics about, like, what constitutes family, what constitutes a relationship, right, um, and how all of those things are racialized and classed. Yeah, and the, the colorism component uh, is something that really came out um, in our, in our interviews, mm -hmm. um, you know, and across all non-white groups, really, uh, white Many white people didn't have the language to talk about this, um, but you know, among Asians, among Latinos, particularly multiracial daters, 
black data is colorism was a big component with, within race preferences. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that, you know, we could do anything differently thinking about the original quantitative data that we're working with. Uh, if we had only had been able to get picture data, that would have been an IRB violation for us. But mm -hmm. um, it would have been so great if we could have gotten something coded based on the picture data. So we could have gotten a sense of skin tone. Yeah. Because I think that is a variable uh, that interacts in really interesting ways with, with race. Uh, so that's one area that um, I think is right for quantitative study as well, because the qualitative work is showing uh, what a huge factor that is. Um, at least in, in the U.S. population, in that romantic economy. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and I, I think this has shifted some because, particularly with OKCupid, they've done a lot of kind of, I think, reworking of how you even present your kind of personal identity information. Uh, you know, but there were definitely, you know, some. It was more than one instance, but it wasn't like a super common instance where you could see that people like literally selected every box um, for you know racial identity. Uh, and so one of the things that I noticed with my dissertation is that certainly you can filter it for race, but to an extent, multiraciality actually undoes the algorithm. So like if you only wanted to look for white people and you set your filter for white, anyone who checks the white box is gonna show up if, um, if, even if they didn't only check the white box. Um, and so it's kind of this way that even when right, someone is trying to eliminate certain people from their pool, if that person has checked at least one of those boxes, they'll still show up, right? They still insert themselves into yeah. your, your view, which I thought that, that was really interesting, right? Because yeah. in some ways that kind of, I think algorithmically, right, reinforces, I think this kind of like specialness of multiracial, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But really it's right, it's just kind of a failure of the, of the algorithm that it can't recognize that someone picked more yeah. than one box. And so I think there were some people who understood that. And so they checked literally every box Right, so there's no way that they can be filtered out, hmm. right? And so I don't think that that was a super common strategy, but it was one that I saw occasionally. Um, and then I think also coming back again to the thing about, about photos is you had people who absolutely look like white people, right, in their, in their photos, but they, you know, picked maybe, you know, a couple of different things. And there were a couple of people that I messaged that had picked like white and Native American as their identities. And when I went to, you know, try to recruit them, they were like, oh, really? Actually, I'm just, you know, a white girl. And, and I recently did a DNA test or an ancestry.com or whatever, right? And found some Native American ancestor. And so for me, I was really curious about this connection between you did ancestry <laughs> and then you went to update your dating profile. Um, so that's actually a future project I haven't done. Yeah. <laughs> um, is, is thinking about the impacts of, of this kind of, this other kind of technology, right? This biomedical technology that I think is making some people rethink like what exactly their racial identity is. Uh, and then like kind of how far does that translate? Do you, you know, start actually like identifying as a multi-racial or multi-ethnic person? Are you going to change your dating profile? You know, are you now going to say that your family is an interracial one? Are your kids now mixed race? Like for me, I'm just kind of curious about kind of what are all of the repercussions, um, you know, kind of beyond just, oh, well, I found out this interesting ancestry about myself. Right. Yeah. Um, That's fascinating. And I love the idea of exploiting lo loopholes in the algorithms, right? I mean, unfortunately, most algorithms are proprietary and black boxes, and we have no idea what goes into yeah. them. We can only speculate. Um, but you know, it would be really interesting to be able to compare, know what's inside of the, those black boxes, and compare across the different platforms um, how the algorithms are operating, and then what are the loopholes that are you know operate that that are disrupting what they're supposed to be doing, and what are the effects in terms of dating interactions? Interesting idea. Um, you know, uh, in thinking about algorithms, one of the aspects I find so interesting is, um, you know, every dating platform has some kind of, you know, matching array, this idea of we have this magic formula that brings people together. And yet, if you look at the studies done by social scientists and a number of um, social psychologists, 
where you know, there have been a few, for example, where people go to this huge face-to-face -face speed dating kind of event. Um, mm -hmm. And everyone has to like say what, what their preferences are in a person, you know, what, what kind of personality they like, what, what, what physical characteristics are they looking for? Um, and then when they actually go through and meet with all of these people, their preferences are not in any way predictive of who they end up really, you know, having mm -hmm. a lot of a lot in common with or finding really attractive for whatever reason. And, you know, for me, that's another reason why um, algorithms based on these alleged preferences uh, can be not even that useful from a, a consumer perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever, you know, the, the companies have a, a vested interest in saying that they work, um, but I don't think they do. I think they work in ways that we don't want them to work. Um, and they work in terms of just uh, funneling down your choice so we don't have this like overwhelming paradox of choice situation. Uh, but there's other ways to do that without sort of narrowing who people see and homogenizing sort of what our dating radar is. Yes, how the algorithm works is actually like the big question, but also the question of the daters. So the users of dating apps that I, that I've interviewed, they were all in a way or another trying to sort out the algorithm or to find loopholes <laughs> in the algorithm so that there is this very personal kind of relationship with the algorithm. So, yeah. okay, algorithm, what, what should we do? Who's gonna be stronger in a sense? So um, I'd like to open up the discussion a bit. Um, we, um, we are not like, hundreds so i think that uh, attendees can be given the uh possibilities to uh just uh, just jump in really break into the discussion i don't recognize the names there which is good so new people i think it uh, it could be a good occasion uh, um to just meet people that are working on similar topics or, or just people that are curious about uh, these, uh, um, these topics. So uh, generally it is Nate that turns uh, attendees into panelists and that um, gives the possibility for them to just turn the camera on and speak. So while this happens, if it happens, uh, there is a bit of a magic that I, I i don't have the control on it and um, i would just uh, ask if someone has some questions and that you want to write in the chat we also have a q a function but i think the chat is better because everybody can um, can read it uh, and i can see the first people coming uh, into the um panelist uh, circle it's a bit um it's a bit of a change of affordance so we have irida and nikki and yeah so really please feel free to break in even with something that is not necessarily a fully fledged question but just a comment uh, an impression that um for those of you who perhaps attended other um other events it's a kind of a um, i really want it to be a relatively informal colloquial space as if we were in a room talking about something of course we are not in a room but we're still talking about something and we can try to make the best we can from the affordances so you can either raise your hand or um or just uh, write in the chat or or just break in really we are not too formal about the about the etiquette let's see if there's someone who breaks the eyes otherwise i have quite a few questions to to ask so and you know what i i could respond to one of your comments earlier carolina which um oh, thanks. It, while we're waiting for people to to speak up um i do think it's a really interesting question and, and I like the way you phrased it, which is, uh, you know, sexual choice being liberated from, you know, from to the private domain, right? And, and this was um, a big fight, especially for the LGBTQ community, right? To be able to have freedom of sexual choice. Uh, so then, you know, how do we balance that with 
the freedom of sexual choice to uh, perpetuate and amplify sexual racism as well. Um, I, I would never argue that we regulate people's choices in, in these domains as they were regulated under anti-miscegenation law. Um, but it raises some real philosophical dilemmas and uh, something I think we do need to grapple with. And online dating is really interesting because it's kind of publicized this again. It's publicized what is private. Yeah, I think that that is the thing. Of course, you cannot regulate and you cannot kind of dictate what people desire. And there's definitely a part of one's desire that doesn't necessarily have to be socially acceptable or morally scrutinized. I mean, people's sexuality, at least in my understanding, can also be something that uh, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, then of course, consensual, etc. cetera, that, um, but within a framework of respect and consent um, doesn't necessarily have to be moralized. Uh, I'm not saying that this is a, is a way of moralizing, but I'm saying that it is a it is quite of a complex uh, conundrum here as to generally then one says oh it's a matter of education it's a matter of uh, um, of what kind of codes and norm circulates and what kind of values circulate and how people internalize uh, them so I'm curious uh, Chantal what what do you think of it I mean I think that these kind of philosophical questions around, you know, kind of desire and intimacy. Uh, I mean, I was reading a lot of stuff on intimacy um, as I, I was kind of, as I've been working through this. And so, I mean, intimacy, I think is just a, what does it mean to be intimate with another person, right? Are there kind of levels to intimacy, um, you know, and can we, I think kind of hold perhaps a willing, sorry, my dog. <laughs> uh, can we hold, I think a willingness to have sex with people of certain social demographics in the same, I think, kind of category as being willing to have a close, romantic, committed relationship with that person, potentially, you know, marrying them. Because I think in a U.S. context, marriage is still kind of held, right, as the most, um, you know, the highest level, I think, right, of intimacy one can achieve, right, is the, definitely the most prioritized culturally, even though, right, there's other ways, right, that people have committed relationships. Because it certainly showed up in my research, right, that there were definitely, there was, I think, a little bit more flexibility in who these women were willing to have sex with versus who they would be willing to have committed long term relationships with. Um, and some of them that was perhaps more intentional than others. I think some of them they didn't realize when they were telling me who they had sex with versus who they had, you know, dated seriously long term and that there was this pattern. Uh, there were definitely a number of women who they didn't realize that that was the pattern until they were being asked to kind of talk about it. Um, I feel like the men tend to be a little bit more perhaps aware, I guess, of like their, you know, kind of like explicit sexual preferences. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we have to be cautious about just because you're willing to have some level of intimacy, whether that's friendship or have sex with someone um, of a different race that that I think doesn't mean that you don't, <laughs> you know, operate in these discriminatory ways or, or even that your, your desire of them, right, sexually isn't rooted in, in some kind of problematic logic. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I get questions from journalists a lot are like, you know, well, what are strategies for how, you know, someone can know that they're being, you know, sexually racist versus, you know, just having a preference. And I think it's really difficult to get kind of, I think the broader public to like step away, I think from thinking about racism, you know, as this kind of individual thing, this individual failing, these particular feelings, right? And, and, and recognize that your preferences don't happen in a vacuum. Like every, everybody's preferences are informed by, you know, all of the things that, that Jennifer mentioned, right? But, you know, all of the broader discourse, who we see on our TVs, you know, who's considered beautiful, like, you know, you're you're not just fat phobic, right? You know, because you're into the gym, right? <laughs> right? Like society tells you to be fat phobic, that fat people are not attractive, that fat people, 
right? And that certain racial groups are more prone, right, to having bodies that might be, right, constructed as fat. Uh, so it's it's all of these things, right? You know, you are, are, are tied up together, and I think it's really difficult for I think the average person to I think disentangle, particularly when it comes I think to racism. Um, that you know that that's just you know people who have bad intentions, right? And and you know, I, so it's it's I, I don't know. I think this question about about, about desirability, I think you know. It, I think it's dealing, I think, with those same kinds of concerns, uh, what it means to be desirable um, and to desire someone else is, is not, again, none of these things are happening in a vacuum. Um, and so <laughs> so oh, I'm trying to think of what the term is that Giddens calls it. I can't think of the term that he uses maybe it's something like plastic, something, there's something, yeah, it's, it's sitting right fine. here and I can't, I can't pull it out. But even that I think is, it's still a fairly heteronormative like logic, which I mean, I think even when we're talking about, I think particularly lesbian and gay people, right? You know, how do they achieve acceptance for their sexuality, right, in broader society, it has to map onto our logics of a heteronormative dynamic, right? So it's, you know, love equals love, and we are very, you know, cisgender, gender normative presenting people who just happen to love someone of the same gender, right, rather than, you know, and pushing, I think, a lot of the, the queer sex and gender queerness, right, that needs to be pushed off right into the dark, right, it needs to be kept secret, right? Because that's, that's not appropriate, <laughs> right? That's, I, and I think that, right, that's kind of animating some of the, the fights over pride right now, right? With, you know, this idea that pride events need to be family friendly. And so kink, kink communities don't need to be there, right? Because that's not an appropriate thing, right? To have out in the daylight. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of this kind of moralizing about, I think, sex in particular, um, in our broader culture, even as we are kind of this hypersexed culture, um, yeah, and so the two things. Informs these dating dynamics. Yeah, I think the two things, in a sense, are also related because okay, we are hypersexual and hyper open in a sense. So sex, sex becomes, um, yeah, more publicized, and also all the proliferation of sexual identities and the fact of all the labels that are attached to it. And dating apps, we were talking about it last week, uh, two weeks ago, actually, but in our last event of how um, people are offered a very long list of options um, about the, to signal their sexuality and gender orientation. And uh, um, I mean, but that's a really, a fairly recent yeah. Development. I mean, some apps were better about this than others in terms of providing a, a, an assortment of both gender identities and yeah. sexual orientation. And then on the other hand, though, you have people saying, uh, well, uh, you know, it, this is too much. I don't identify necessarily in this category. And then uh, there is a sense in which, okay, you can multiply the category forever, but there is always going to be the other you know, like the plus in LGBTQIA yeah. plus, there's always something that kind of escapes this categorization. But, but there is also a sense in which, uh, okay, there is an attempt, I don't know, perhaps there is an attempt to moralize and, uh, and kind of regulate sex so that it becomes a more pleasant experience, especially for women that have been kind of excluded from pleasure for a while, that is not, um, that is not discriminated uh, for people that have different uh, kind of sexual orientations. Uh, um, but then, but then, yes, I think as you uh, as you said, or at least this is a, this is a, an insight that I got. There is also like where does how do you find the line between what is kind of making sex a more pleasant, a more equal, democratic, whatever good adjective, uh, good quality you want to attach to it. Uh, and uh, when it becomes a, rega a moralizing, regulatory kind of thing in itself, 
that this is very difficult, I think, also at the level of public discourse, at the level of communication. Yeah. Well, and I mean, and I think as much as we're interested in trying to eliminate discrimination along racial, sex, class, gender lines, I think we also have to allow that there are people who take pleasure from the fetishization of those things. Um, and so if we are prioritizing consensual pleasure, right, do we also have to right, leave room for the ways that people take pleasure from things that might be considered problematic? Um, and I think that that can be a difficult, I think, kind of a thread, <laughs> I think, kind of to balance. Um, because obviously there is, you know, a lot of racial fetishization that people take pleasure from, you know, and when, when I wrote individually about my one trans woman respondent, you know, she kind of talked about that she liked the fact that she was kind of fetishized for being trans and for, you know, being this very dark brown skinned, you know, Afro Latina, <laughs> right? And, and, and so kind of the ways that she basically kind of made that fetishization work for her. And so it's like, I can't necessarily, I can't tell her that that's wrong, right? Like you can take pleasure from whatever it is that you want, right? And, you know, we can sit here and we can intellectualize how that's rooted in all of these broader structures. But I think, you know, we also have to think about how, you know, who are we to tell people that they can't take pleasure in things? Um, but right, I think, well, and, and, you know, that we can then extrapolate that to, well, then who are we to say that people can't have racial preferences for who they want to date? Right, right. Yeah, I, I think that sexuality um, is so bound up uh, in the forbidden as well. Um, and at least from my perspective and thinking about the way we were looking at this, um, what's most important I think is the consent that two individuals or three or four or whatever the dynamic may be, all need to be on board with the racialized fetishization, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, prob the biggest problem is when the fetishization is you know, coming from one side, particularly from you know, men of a different race um, and subjecting women who didn't want to be subjected to that. Uh, yeah. So, but I agree. I mean, I think consent here is one of the key elements, you know, agreed upon uh, rules of engagement um, around sexuality. Yeah, yeah but I mean, I, I think that the apps, it depends on the app, I think kind of right how they even navigate this notion of consent. I mean, so you have some where it's built into kind of the whole ethos. So right, Bumble gets created because of, you know, sexual harassment on Tinder. Uh, so, you know, they come up with this logic of, you know, you have to both match and the woman has to initiate, right, the, the interaction, right. But then for me, I'm like, well, now Bumble has expanded to not just heterosexual, at least, right, exchanges. So what does it mean when two women right. match, like both, it doesn't matter which woman yeah. initiates, right? Like, so it's one of those things that like, there's some kinds of logics that are framed around a heterosexual encounter. And as you point out in the book, right, particular kind of gendered logics about who messages first or who initiates the conversation mm -hmm. uh, that break down as soon as it's not a heterosexual <laughs> encounter right. anymore. Right. Um, and even, even in the, the heterosexual setting, it also breaks down. As soon as that first mm -hmm. contact is made, then it, you know, it goes right back very often to the heterosexual male making the overtures and driving forward that interaction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> that was definitely uh, part of what I experienced when I was recruiting white men for interviews. Um, a lot of harassment. <laughs> Um, which I mean, I guess when you're trying to use the actual apps themselves to recruit people because you know, <laughs> people are that's how you know for sure the person is actively right. using the app is to find them on there. Um, you know, yeah, so it's just it, it was uh it, it was an experience. I need to I need to write like a methodological article. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the kinds of stuff that was happening there because it was just re it, it was just so markedly different from trying to recruit women because you do have straight women who have anxiety anytime a woman messages them because mm. like, oh what is this woman trying to hit on me um which i'd be curious about and that you know was in 2015 
before a lot of these apps have started to introduce like a friendship component. And I'm really curious about how that works. Um, and I mean, I've talked to like people, my, my younger siblings age, and sometimes even my students. And it's really interesting to me, the ways that they've started to operationalize these dating apps for purposes other than dating. So, you know, using the GPS location apps to literally just find people in your area to be friends with, not necessarily to date. Yeah. But then also I think Tinder has, like they can sign up with their college email and only see people who go to their same university. Oh, yeah. Um, and so they literally promote campus events via like Tinder accounts, mm -hmm. like, which to me, I'm just like, <laughs> I, don't, I never would have occurred to me, right, as a college student to, you know, to use Tinder. Well, I don't even think Tinder existed back then, but, you know, I think we had OkCupid and like plenty of fish and like it never would have occurred to me, right, that there would have been, you know, like the Black Student Union account on one of those, <laughs> you know, websites that's, you know, promoting yeah. events, but that is, yeah. you know, so that's, I think, the thing that's actually really fun about studying these apps is because the apps themselves evolve so much because of the ways that they have to respond to things happening on the websites and things happening out in the political world but then also the users themselves find all of these really interesting ways to you know circumvent or undermine or utilize in different ways from what the actual intention is um yeah which I, think I think you know is, is really interesting yeah, this is uh, this is also one of the things that um, I have explored in 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 my research, and I keep on um, exploring. Um, and it's something that can be applied, perhaps, to every app. So there is a sense of creativity from the side of the user, or non-obvious or non-prescribed actions uh, or uses. Uh, but then, on the other hand, if you think about the business model of the app, then the business model of the app wants people to be stuck to the app. Like apps are sticky, as, as media scholars say. So in a sense, to make the app, dating app a nice place to be, nice in inverted commas, but a place in which you can do things that do not necessarily lead to meeting the right partner. Because once you meet the right partner, whatever right means to a person, then you don't need the app anymore. So there is a bit of this uh, contradictory, I think, apparently contradictory logic. Uh, I read it somewhere, I don't remember where, but it was like, I don't know, like the Harvard Business Review or Forbes, like, like a business -y, um, uh, outlet. And uh, they were saying, oh, business apps are the only, uh, sorry, business apps, dating apps are the only business that need an unsatisfied customer. <laughs> or, uh, or at least serial monogamy, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so I would like to ask a, a, a question, and this is a question about methodology, and Chantelle, you anticipated it a bit. Um, I'm curious, uh, uh, and yes, this, uh, um, I'm curious to know how you recruit a participant, and you partially reflect to this question, and also I'm curious to know how you um, in, the, in interviews, how would you expand methodologically on what is what the researcher has to has to do in a sense uh, uh, to establish that mutual trust that is needed for someone to share even the details uh, or part of them about their personal life, their sexual life, their desire, their dating life. There is a very private dimension, as, as, as we said before. So I'm, I'm curious to know how you um, approach this. Like the recruiter. And also, so I'd like to ask if you have sociologically looked at the intersection between the racial element uh, and uh, others such as uh, class, for instance. Uh, if you look at the uh, intersectionality of these uh, uh, features, I've noticed that these are anecdotal evidences uh, that people are may be quite torn between multiple identities and multiple subjectivities. 
that they perceive the demand to be clear about. So what yeah. gender, what's my sexuality, what's my race, and what kind of sexual values, uh, and what 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 is that I look for in terms of monogamy, polyamorous, uh, whatever kind of configuration of relationship, and, and the values attached to this identitarian yeah. aspects are not necessarily in harmony. Um, so yes, these are my two questions for both. Yeah, of I mean the class thing is hard because. So, I mean, I think social science kind of more broadly often uses um, education as a proxy for social class. Um, and that gets, I think, kind of iffy when you're looking at online dating because there's a higher, I think, likelihood that your users are going to be college educated depending on the app. But I think overall, they're, they tend to be more likely to... Because the thing with dating apps, unless you are match or eHarmony, um, you know, well, the ones I think that really push marriage as the ultimate outcome, they don't really advertise. Uh, you don't see commercials for, you know, okay, Cupid or, or Bumble, really. You know, I feel like so much of the knowledge of them is spread through word of mouth, which you often learn about in these kind of like collegiate spaces. Um, and what I found was there's definitely, I think, different reputations attached to different, uh, I described it as kind of almost like neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, okay, Cupid is definitely viewed as, you know, more queer friendly. Um, certainly, you know, more, it, 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 I think, younger college educated. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people described it as this nicer alternative to match because they liked, you know, the essay prompts and, and all these other kind of aspects compared to like a plenty of fish, which also has, you know, one of the largest, you know, user bases globally. But I think plenty of fish is viewed as uh, less highly educated. Um, I mean, I quite literally had respondents, you know, describe it as ghetto, right? So there is, I think, a perception of who the users are, who the available pool is on some of these apps. And so, um, and, and I think to some extent apps use that to their advantage. So, I mean, obviously you have these kind of elite dating apps like the league where you literally have to be some kind of like professional to have a, an account on there, uh, you know, and, and the logic of that algorithm, right? is kind of trying to match you up with people who are similarly well-liked. But I mean, but even OkCupid has this kind of attractiveness rating that is rooted in, um, you used to be able to like, literally rate someone's profile with stars. And so people who have like the highest like star rating like showed up differently in the algorithm. Now, I think a lot of it does have to do with things like based on how often you're being contacted. Um, and interestingly enough with OkCupid, if someone's inbox is full, it'll prompt you to literally pay money to be able to message them, right? So it's it's kind of incentivizing like, oh, this person's really popular because their inbox is full, pay more money so that you can actually message this person who's really popular. Oh, so you can add to the queue of people they will never respond to. Right, 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 right. So it's, it's there was just a lot of things in doing this kind of digital ethnography of really, you know, kind of like looking at all of the different filters and trying to use them and, and you know, kind of, creating a profile expressly for the purpose of trying to recruit people that I learned a lot about how the app just worked. Um, and just things that it ne I, I don't think I would have learned otherwise. Like it never would have occurred to me that they'd be charging people money to message someone who already has a full inbox. Um, yeah, so, so some of me being able to find out about this perception of other apps was because I was explicitly asking, you know, about what apps do you use? how do you rank these in terms of preference um, as part of the interview. Another aspect of the interview that I did is what I call a platform elicitation. So basically drawing from like photo elicitation or like uh, walkabout um, strategies or, or methodologies. So I would have them open up their app and like kind of walk me through their process. So, you know, when you first open the app, what's the first thing you go to look at? Okay, why do you look at that? 
Uh, let's go look at some people's profiles. Okay, what do you like about this person's profile? You know, and they would kind of go through that. And then that just kind of opened up to like, oh, here, let me send you this. Let me show you this text message so-and-so just sent me, or let me show you this. So then they just start sending, they just start showing me things. Um, I think the women were definitely more comfortable, I think, talking to me about sex than I think some of the men were. I think the thing I also had to navigate with recruiting directly from the app is I have to acknowledge that perhaps some of the reason that people are responding is because they might find me attractive. Um, and then that is part of their reason for responding to the message and also showing up to the interview. Um, and I think that was definitely the case more so with men than women, though I think about half of my sample of women were like bisexual or pansexual in some way. And so, you know, the women were less, I think, aggressive about the like hitting yeah. on me or trying to make demands. For, like yeah. I had men literally, you know, like suggest that I needed to exchange sex with them for them to participate in the research, which like, you know, like for me, I'm like, okay, this is a breakdown of communication. I don't want to talk to Sure. Um, what, what, but, yeah, so there, I, in, in recruiting people directly from the app, it allowed me to find people who are actively using the app, but it also, I think, introduced perhaps this other kind of, perhaps these other components, like I can't really control for if they're showing up because oh. they find me attractive, right? Like I, I can't really... I don't really know how to like sociologically deal with that. It's a thing I have to acknowledge that was there and perhaps influenced the degree of perhaps intimacy that I was able to build during the interview and the comfort that the person felt. Um, I mean, I think me being multiracial went a long way with these multiracial women in terms of making them feel comfortable talking to me. And we were in similar, similar I think kind of social uh, position, like, again, I had a disproportionately well-educated sample, um, and folks were fairly close to me in age, so I think that that went a long way. Um, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, I just want to um, share with you a comment uh, that uh, we got, which is uh, with a meta comment, is this discussion illustrates how difficult it is to speak about racism. Um, uh, Jennifer, is it is it difficult and uh, uh, to speak and research about racism also in like academic for us? I should say this oh. one. Um, well, I think it's complicated. I think that um, I, mean, I give a lot of credit to the Black Lives Matters movement and really changing um, how politicians and the mainstream public are even talking about race. So, I mean, you hear people throwing around terms that you know, we're only being used by critical race scholars five years ago, uh, you know, whether that's sort of um, institutional racism or even using terms like white supremacy. Um, that was never acceptable to, to use as a mainstream politician in the past, and I think it is now. Um, so in some ways, I think race has become a lot easier to talk about because more people are seeing it, um, more people are seeing um, what is usually so invisible in, in part because of social media. I think social media deserves a lot of credit and that is how BLM and other social movements have really been able to promote um, what's happening that we don't see, um, whether it's you know police brutality or other forms of more prosaic uh, racism. So I think it, we have the grammar to talk about it as, a, as at least as American citizens in a way that we and I should say whites, because I think many non-whites have always been able to see racism and talk about it since they experience it. They're the ones experiencing it. Um, on the other hand, you know, in academic circles, I also think that there is um, particularly, you know, there's definitely a, um, a movement around sort of identity politics and who can speak about race and who can study race. Um, and, you know, part of the reason that Celeste and Ken and I worked so well together in this book um, is we all have very different perspectives racially um, and also in terms of gender. And so um, I really think that I would love to see more collaboration like what Celeste and Ken and I had 
on works of race so that it's not necessarily a white person speaking for others, um, but that the white perspective is still introduced um, to, to that, to that uh, communication. I mean, I think the thing I'll add to that is, I think even though I think certain kinds of racial discourse and as you said, grammar has become more mainstream I think it's also because it's becoming more mainstream. There's actually, I think, been a lot of um, misreading and misinterpretation of what these words mean. Um, particularly, I think when it comes to things like intersectionality, um, and I mean, obviously, we're seeing that, you know, with the, you know, the critical race theory wars right now, right? Um, one, right, it is relabeling things like white privilege, right? And white fragility as critical race theory, which they are not, um, which seems to come as a surprise to some people. Um, and, and, you know, to an extent, you I mean, you know, I'm in Florida. So, you know, we just had, you know, our governor, you know, pass this bill that say, you know, universities have to do, you know, political belief surveys of, yeah. of the staff, students, and faculty, uh, you know, and obviously they, they banned critical race theory and explicitly the 1619 project, right, at the K through 12 level, um, for sure, it's still not super clear kind of what will happen at the collegiate level. Yeah. Um, so I, I think just because the, the people like Hillary Clinton now use language like structural racism <laughs> and talk about intersectionality or or being intersectional. Um, I don't know if that actually has led to like a depth of actual understanding of what, what, what the processes are. Cause I think even with sexual racism, right? You know, that kind of got like a big media splash and, you know, the Daily Show did a whole thing, you know, where they had, I think a, a black and an Asian correspondent, you know, kind of talk about this, um, you know, cause I think this was in light of resources like you and Ken's and then I think other data right that was showing that you know black women and Asian men had the worst prospects right you know in, in on, on dating apps and so I think that sexual racism has been this super youthful kind of concept I think to kind of talk about this phenomenon but again I think it also people are still individualized I think there still is a lot of struggle I think in the mainstream, I think, to kind of move the discussion away from individual action to, to structural phenomena and really actually understand what structural phenomena means. Yeah. Um, which, which is why everyone yeah. should have sociology in the curriculum of high school. That's, that's my promotion <laughs> right there for my discipline. I think even with that, I struggle with, so I mean, you know, I, I'm a very committed sociologist and I think more people could use a sociological framework, but I feel like there, <laughs> I mean, I think about, you know, as someone who teaches a race and racism class, and I think about the kinds of resistance that I receive to literally just presenting information about, you know, people don't want to hear right, that, that they are in a structurally privileged social position that is very difficult to contend with because they feel like that is a personal failing. It makes them a bad person, right? It, again, it devolves into this mm -hmm. thing when it's like, no, like we're, we're talking about like the after effects of literally hundreds of years of, you know, denying certain people rights and resources and attempts to, you know, chances to advance. And I'm like, just because we've instituted laws, right, to remedy some of that, all of that history doesn't just go away. All of that inequality doesn't just go away, right? And there's other, there's all these ways in which it shows up, right? So I'm like, you know, redlining is not just an issue because, you know, it now still impacts, you know, property values today, <laughs> right? You know, and how much how little, right, a black person or even a Latinx person's right house will accrue in value compared to a white person's house. I'm like, it literally has environmental impacts. We have evidence, right, that formerly redlined neighborhoods are several degrees warmer than non-redlined neighborhoods because of the lack of green spaces, because green spaces drive up property values, right? So 
there's all of these ways in which those things are connected. And, and, and I think that that can be really difficult to communicate in a sociology class with students who have maybe taken a sociology class before, let alone right to the broader public, I think who, I think has, we also have to think about, I think the kind of anti-intellectualism and anti-science um, that, you know, I think it's not just like anti-social science. Like, I think there's a lot of just anti-science in general. I mean, look at the response, you know, to vaccines, yeah. <laughs> right? So. Yeah. Um, so we are <laughs> coming to, to a, 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 an end, coming to a close. Of course, um, as always, uh, we finish up perhaps with more questions than, than answer. I would uh, give Jen, uh, if you want to wrap up and, and offer some final thoughts, I think that would be sweet. Oh, sure. Well, um... One thing that I would be really interested in looking at, uh, Chantal, with your work, um, as you re-interview some of these folks, is when thinking about the vetting strategies uh, that people are using um, when they get to, you know, are trying to feel someone out. I'm, I would be really curious about any of your um, Asian multiracial respondents, uh, how after the last year of COVID and anti-Asian sentiment, that may be feeding into or and also bringing greater awareness among the Asian community of this kind of um, sexual racism and other kinds of racism that spill into the uh, off, offline world. Uh, so that would be uh, really interesting. Um, and to speak, Carolina, back to some of your work. Um, yes, I, I think that, you know, it is a cultural artifact that these profiles and the process of, of meaning making in a, in a profile and the kinds of activities that people are engaging in without ever intending uh, to, to meet up with the person um, is a fascinating social phenomena um, that merits a lot more um, exploration and understanding. And I wanted to mention that, you know, in our book, we're focusing almost like you exclusively on, on racial, sexual um, uh, racism. But everyone we talked to, you know, there was just really interesting kind of epiphanies uh, of a sexual debut um, of, you know, when I turn uh, 18, I created my profile and I had to really think about how am I going to identify myself sexually? Um, and do I want to come out of the closet now? Is this the way I'm going? You know, and um, what what does that mean? How has that changed that entire process uh, that has happened in so many other contexts previously or, or never happened at all? Um, and yeah, so I, I think that just the process of construction um, of one's identity itself uh, is very, very rich for, for more analysis. Yeah, this is what I'm looking at now. Like the more I interview people, I recently interviewed 35 people, which is a small scale qualitative project, but give me a lot of insights exactly on what you said, like this uh, dating up as a sexual debut in a sense, which perhaps um, not, not historically accurate, but maybe culturally inspiring could be the uh, comparison with the actual social debut of um, mm, yeah. society that at mm -hmm. some point you, and then you have to take some decisions. What's my gender orientation? What's my sexuality? What, what, how do I present myself? And also people try out different, they try out their erotic capital, their sexual capital in a sense. Um, so I've been th thinking about like framing dating apps also as these technologies of sexualization in a kind of a Foucauldian uh, way, but to give a sense of how they really, um, they, they're really, like you said this uh, term before, like the social institution um, of the contemporary romantic cultures. And I think there's a lot of sociological work, at least um, in Lutz and, and others that, that, that follow a, a, a path, uh, say, okay, contemporary romantic culture is deinstitutionalized, it's deregulated. And I think that in a sense, but from, okay, the consumer unconscious, a market abyssus, economic abyssus uh, that is pervasive, hence it pervades also romance and romantic scripts. But I think that they think up somehow they are providing uh, not necessarily for good, but 
as a fact, as a matter of fact, they are providing these social institutions that regulates, that organize, that support, that enables, and that offer this, uh, in the, this environment that is, of course, super uncertain, very problematic in the sense that it's also an industry. But I think that uh, the ways in which it may transform to an extent, or I don't know, remediate, reproduce, I don't know, but cannot be underestimated. Yeah. So, yeah. So think of like India, that this huge promotional campaign in campuses, and they promote this all approach to sex and 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 love that is uh, um, that is post traditional, mm. uh, and so it has. They're very interesting cultural objects. I mean, I don't have fully fledged argument, but yes, I think the way you put it is exactly where I'm trying to go. And then you have just people like fantasizing, they use as a kind of a prosthetic of the fantasy, something in between perhaps consuming pornography and, uh, and the actual doing of it, whatever mm -hmm. it is, um, especially with dating apps that are aimed at the sexual niche or people with certain kinks. Um, etc. So fascinating. Uh, we shall catch up again soon, <laughs> or at least at some point. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can talk about the international context stuff. I, I just wrote, finished writing a piece, and it was really interesting to kind of learn about how some of these apps have like literal, like kind of translation mechanisms bed, bed, built in so that when you travel internationally, you can still like hook up with people in places where you don't yeah. speak the language. <laughs> And they like literally call it, you know, like passport. Like they have these like particular names for it for you to be able to access those services. So it's uh, it's definitely interesting too, I think, to kind of think about how these apps play this role in, in a globalized world, right? In a globalized sexual world uh, and romantic economy. Okay, thank you very much. I won't keep you much longer after a while. It should be made kind of illegal to have Zoom meetings longer then an hour and a half, maximum two. We are the sweet spot of an hour 45, 15 minutes glamorously late. We have had today um, quite a quiet audience, which is interesting. And perhaps it says something of what, um, of what has been uh, posted in the Q&A section, how difficult it is to talk about race and racism. Um, but this is an interpretation that can be totally wrong. Uh, but, uh, but yes, so um, thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day, night, morning, wherever you are, <laughs> whatever time is it uh, there. And uh, I hope to catch up with you soon. And thanks again, Nate and the Center for Digital Inquiry. And uh, yes. Uh